the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your mostly bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal. I'm your host, John Ross, joined today by Arthur Spitzer, who is the legal director of the ACLU of D.C. Also on the show are Sheldon Gilbert and Robert Everett Johnson of the Institute for Justice. Arthur, you've done some cool stuff. You represented the KKK when it was denied a permit to march in D.C. You challenged a strict $100 limit on campaign contributions to the D.C. mayor and city council candidates. And you've represented a Gitmo detainee who was held without charge for over a decade. Thanks for being here. My pleasure, and I'm, we're hoping that uh, we don't have to do a reprise of our uh, KKK case with Unite the Right that's applied for a permit for uh, Lafayette Park in August. Let's kick things off in the D.C. Circuit, where you are representing an American citizen who's been detained by the U.S. military in Iraq for eight months and counting now, without being charged with a crime and without being brought before a judge. Um, I'm sure you'd like the courts to address that, But there are some preliminary questions uh, before the courts will even get to that. So could you walk us through what those are? Sure. So we learned about this situation from the New York Times in September. And um, we asked the Department of Defense to tell us who this American citizen was that they were holding, um, which they refused to do. Uh, And so we decided to file a petition for habeas corpus on his behalf, really because there was no one else to do that. The first thing the government said was, well, you've got no standing to represent him. You don't even know his name. And we said, well, no, we don't know his name because you won't tell us. And how can his family, for example, bring a a writ on his behalf, a petition on his behalf, because they don't know who it is either. Nobody knows. Um, There was a lot of wrangling over over that, whether we even had standing to to, um, to, to sue. Uh, eventually, the district court um, uh, ordered the government to tell us his name and to allow us to have a, a telephone call with him, um, which had to be set up on a secure connection from the Pentagon. Um, uh, we spoke with him. He um, uh, agreed that he would like to pursue a petition for habeas corpus and, uh, and retained us to represent him in that. And so at that point, at least our ability to to pursue the litigation became clear. Um, uh, The government was then required to file what's called a return to the the petition, which is equivalent to a a response, an answer, or a motion to dismiss a complaint, and they did that. They believe that he was a fighter with ISIS, but apparently they don't have enough evidence to charge him, uh, or for whatever reason they don't want to charge him. uh, and uh, yet they don't want to continue holding him indefinitely in Iraq, and, and of course we don't think they can continue holding him indefinitely. Um, we filed a, uh, uh, an opposition to, to their papers, and the, the case was moving towards a hearing on the merits when the government decided that they wanted to transfer him to a third country uh, without his consent. And so we ran back into the district court in January with emergency papers asking the court to order the government not to render him to a third country uh, on the ground that he's a United States citizen and he has certain rights. And one of those rights is that you can't, the United States can't just pick up an American citizen somewhere in the world and take him to another country and put him in the custody of another government that way without some affirmative, some positive legal authority, like an extradition treaty and an extradition proceeding, for example. Uh, The district judge agreed with us, the government appealed, and the D.C. Circuit agreed with us about that. This was apparently the first time the U.S. government has tried to pull off a trick like that with with no legal authority other than their own say-so. They say he's an enemy combatant. And if he is an enemy combatant, then they do have certain rights. They could, you know, they could... um, Uh, transfer him to another country consistent with the laws of war. Um, But first, there's the question of whether he is actually an enemy combatant. And we're prepared to litigate that. And uh, his view is that he was not allied with ISIS, that he was uh, captured by ISIS and and forced to work with them while he was in their custody uh, before he escaped and was eventually surrendered himself to free Kurdish forces or Syrian forces in Syria and said, I'm an American citizen, and they brought him to the U.S. forces there. So there was actually a date um, in June scheduled for a hearing on the merits of the question of whether he's an enemy combatant or not, which has now been postponed because the government decided they were going to release him in Syria. 
um, where he'd originally been taken into custody. Um, and we went back into court with a temporary restraining order saying you can't re- you, you're required to release him in a safe place. And the government agrees that safe release is, is um, an obligation. Um, and they say we're, we, we believe that the place where we're going to release him is safe. And we say, not on your life. And, and uh, in fact, we've submitted to the court um, uh, press releases from the Department of Defense of recent date uh, recounting all the active combat that's going on in this very area. Um, and so now the, the, uh, there's going to be a hearing, I think the date is July 13th, Friday, that July 13th, uh, where the district court's going to going to consider the question of whether the government can release him in Syria, whether that would be a safe release. And the hearing on the question of whether he is indeed an enemy combatant has been postponed to a later date. So that that was what sort of struck me as odd about this case. When you read the dissent is Judge Henderson seems to say, you know, there's all this evidence that he is a part of ISIS, that almost the dissent almost treats it as established that he's an ISIS member. And yet the government just doesn't want to have this hearing where they actually have to prove that. And do you have any sense of why that is? No, I I think that's somewhat puzzling. Um, They do say that they have a lot of evidence, and and this was not evidence that was obtained by torturing him, and so it wouldn't be inadmissible on that ground. Um, And so it's it's a a mystery to me uh, why they don't want to charge him. And he's, of course, prepared to testify in his own behalf um, that the evidence they have is misleading, um, you know, that whatever he did, he was, he was coerced into, into doing. And, uh, you know, we'd be perfectly happy, and I think he'd be perfectly happy, to take his chances with a federal judge or a jury. You heard about the case from uh, reading about it in the New York Times. Um, how did the New York Times find out about it? Like, how did they how did they get the story? They have their ways. They have their ways. We we don't know what those are. Um, how how often uh, do you run across instances like that where, you know, you're uh, you're finding out about potential cases by reading the newspaper? Um, it happens more often than you might think. Um, um, uh, we you know I was driving this weekend and heard a, a news item on the radio about this trans woman who was kicked out of Cuba Libre restaurant when she tried to use the women's restroom, and that may turn into a case too. Um, so it's not that unusual that that something that is interesting enough to make the news is also interesting enough for us. Now, now can you tell us kind of the process? Um, you know, again, you've got this weird situation where you hear about an individual, you don't know the person's name, you file the habeas petition, you know, on behalf of, you know, this, this John Doe. Um, what is, what is, what is that like? Have you had to do this before? Have you done, uh, kind of, I, I know you've done other Gitmo cases, but, um, is this kind of a surreal experience to be trying to litigate on behalf of a client whose name you don't even know? That was a first for me. Um, uh, we, of course, have represented many John Doe clients, but they've been John Doe or Jane Doe to the public, not to us and not to the court. Um, so uh, as far as I can recall, this is the first time we've had a, a client who we didn't know his name. We didn't know anything about him except that he was reportedly uh, in the New York Times a U.S. citizen. Is that a first for the courts as well? It seems like something I've never heard of happening before. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. It might be, yeah. And to the extent you can uh, answer this, I'm kind of curious about what that call was like when you actually first got to talk to the uh, the, the putative client, right? Like, what was it like yeah. for this person? How did this person react to yeah. be able to talk no, to somebody? I, and... I, I wish I could give you a better answer on that. I was actually not on that call. Um, uh, several of my colleagues from National up in New York were on that call. Um, he, I, I, am, I am told, and, and this is not a secret, that he speaks English fluently, and so there was not a need for an interpreter on the call. And, um, uh, and, he, and he had enough familiarity with the U.S. legal system. He knew what habeas corpus was. He knew what lawyers were and what they did. And so it was, it was not starting from complete scratch. Uh, and and um, once, once, uh, once it was explained to him who we were, what we, why we were talking to him, um, it, it was not a, it was not a, a difficult thing for him to say. Yes, I, I'm happy to have a lawyer. I'd like to be, I'd like to be freed from custody. 
Yeah, if he knew what uh, habeas corpus was, he's he's ahead of most first year law students. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, real quick, if he was a U.S. citizen, then why why were you worried he wouldn't speak English? Oh, well, there are certainly U.S. citizens who are not terribly fluent in English. Um, he was born here of um, uh, parents who are citizens of another country, so he was a natural-born U.S. citizen, but he's lived most of his adult life elsewhere in the world. Uh, so with that, let's move on to the next case, which involves whether the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial for an offense that can result in deportation uh, applies to your client. So uh, he's not actually our client. We're amicus in his case. Um, his name is Jean-Baptiste Badou. Um, he comes from a, fan- a francophone African country. He's actually a, uh, a minister there of his religion. And he came to the United States some years ago um, seeking political asylum on the ground that his religion was persecuted in his country. Um, And his asylum application has been pending. Um, In the meantime, he was accused of um, a misdemeanor-level sexual assault on a young woman who he was alleged to have touched inappropriately outside her genes, um, which is why it was only a misdemeanor. Um, he um, was brought to trial in D.C. Superior Court, and he demanded a jury. Um, Now, in D.C., we had a law that was passed 15 or 20 years ago called the Misdemeanor Streamlining Act. Um, There was a feeling on the part of the D.C. Council that the the D.C. Superior Court was clogged with many jury trials. This was a time when D.C.'s finances were in particularly tight shape, and they were looking for ways to save money. And so the council reduced the maximum sentence for most misdemeanors from a year down to 180 days. And under Supreme Court precedent, if, a, if the maximum penalty for a crime is uh, 180 days or less, then it's considered a petty offense and is not jury demandable under the Sixth Amendment. And the, and the explicit intention of this Misdemeanor Streamlining Act was to get rid of jury trials for most misdemeanors in D.C. We, we opposed the law. We opposed the bill in the D.C. Council, and we lost. There was a, a lawsuit um, shortly after the law was passed challenging the constitutionality of this because the whole point was to get rid of jury trials. Um, but, the, but the courts upheld the law. They said, you know, a petty offense is a petty offense, sort of open and shut. Um, Um, We filed, I wrote an amicus brief a few years ago in another case in which uh, a woman woman uh, was was divorced or getting divorced from her husband. They had a minor altercation. Um, Both went to the police station. He got there first, she being an immigrant and he being uh, an American citizen. He got there first and said, she assaulted me. And uh, Apparently, by winning the race to the station house, they charged her, um, and and his injuries in this fight consisting of that she had scratched his arm and that he had to apply a paper towel to <laughs> to to uh, solve his wounds. Um, but nevertheless, she was uh, convicted of simple assault, which is enough to put her at great risk of deportation, and. Um, But she had not demanded a jury in advance of her trial. Um, On appeal, she was assigned a court-appointed lawyer who raised this issue uh, and said because she faces deportation as a result of this conviction, she should have been allowed to have a jury trial. And the Court of Appeals considered that under the clear error standard because it had not been preserved, and they said it's not a clear error. Um, but, but So we had gotten into this issue far enough to write an amicus brief and be educated on the subject. And so Mr. Badu comes along. Um, he was represented by D.C. Law Students in Court, which is a program where law students get to actually brief and argue real cases under the supervision of, of grown-up lawyers. And, um, and so on Mr. Badu's behalf, uh, a jury trial was demanded in advance, and the uh, Superior Court judge said, I, I don't think I have... The, um, the authority to, to grant you a jury trial because this is a petty offense. So he was tried. He was convicted of misdemeanor sexual assault, for which deportation is apparently a certain consequence. Um, and he appealed. We filed an amicus brief with the D.C. Public Defender Service arguing that, the, that deportation is a, is a very serious penalty, far more serious 
for many people than 180 days in jail would be. If he's sent back to his country, he faces the persecution for which he was seeking asylum in the first place. And um, a panel of the D.C. Circuit denied, uh, rejected his appeal, affirmed the conviction. We sought, we supported the, the party seeking rehearing on bank, which was granted. And the case was argued on bank more than two years ago. Uh, the case sat in the uh, under advisement on bank for more than two years. The D.C. Court of Appeals is not a fast court. Um, that's not wildly outside the range of experience in that court, sad to say. But it is still way above average. And, um, um, and, um, and the reason for, the, for somewhat of the delay became obvious when we saw the opinion. It was a, a long opinion with several concurrences and, and two dissents. Um, but ruled in his favor and said that, that deportation was such a significant penalty that it entitled him to a jury trial. The fact that deportation came from Congress and the misdemeanor came from the D.C. Code was an issue, and the majority felt that that didn't matter, that, it, that, they came, that these punishments came from different sovereigns, um, particularly because D.C. is, after all, a federal colony. Um, um, and, uh, and there was also argument over whether deportation is actually punishment at all. It's a civil matter. It's not a criminal penalty, but the majority got over that hurdle as well and said, we're talking about the real world here. This is a, a serious penalty. So it's a, it's a precedent for D.C. It means that people uh, charged with petty crimes but who are facing deportation if convicted, I think now have pretty clearly a right to a jury trial, and, and uh, this is not such an unusual circumstance. There are lots of non-citizens living in D.C., um, and uh, to be charged with uh, simple assault or urinating in public or uh, going through a red light or whatever, you know, these are not s uh, very serious crimes that are considered petty offenses, and so uh, I think there's going to be a regular flow of, of jury-demandable misdemeanors now. And maybe it reopens the question of whether the Misdemeanor Streamlining Act ought to be repealed. Uh, former Chief Judge Eric Washington wrote a concurring opinion uh, in which he highlighted this. You know, some of the dissenting judges said this is really um, unseemly now. We're saying that a non-citizen gets a right to a jury trial where charged with the same crime a citizen would not get a jury trial. And and Judge Washington said, well, that's right, and the solution to that is to give them all a jury trial, uh, not none of them. And we say, you know, three cheers for that. Uh, and, and we do plan, actually, to go back to the city council and to say um, we, think, we think people who are facing jail time of any length ought to have a right to a jury trial, as they do in, in uh, something like 40 out of 50 states. Well, on that same point as to the sort of lack of symmetry here. I, I wonder, too, if that could be addressed by expanding this same reasoning to other types of civil penalties that people can suffer when they uh, are convicted of a, of a misdemeanor offense. So, you know, you, you might have a situation, for instance, and I think one of the dissent mentions this, or someone might lose their medical license because they've been convicted of a misdemeanor. And for that person, losing their medical license would be a far greater penalty than um, you know, uh, 180 days in jail, certainly. Um, might there be a right to a jury trial in that kind of case as well? Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, a, a very apt observation and, um, and another reason why everybody who's facing jail time um, ought to be entitled to a jury trial because, the, I mean, there could be all kinds of consequences. Losing a license could be one. Um, it could count as a strike in a, in a three strikes kind of a situation. Um, so, uh, and, and, uh, and most states, I think the actual number is 41 out of 50, um, provide a right for jury trial when the defendant is facing any incarceration, and we certainly think that ought to be the rule. You know, I, um, a very good friend who graduated from law school the same year I did is probably my, my most you know, financially successful friend who graduated that year. And uh, he's in the D.C. area, and after he graduated from law school, he just started his own shop, 
And all he does is uh, criminal misdemeanor traffic violations in the D.C. area, right? Yeah. And his clientele are all professionals who face serious consequences if they have like a, you know, this misdemeanor traffic violation. They could lose their law license. It could you know, be reportable on all sorts of different federal forms if they're lobbyists, if they're doctors. So you have this, you know, and kind security of security clearances yeah, are a security big Security clearances here in are a, exactly yeah. that's yeah. a huge yeah. um, part of uh, of his clientele are all these individuals who, you know, that traffic violation for going too fast in Fairfax County, I mean, it has life-altering consequences, right? And there's no chance for a, you know, a jury trial for a lot of these. So he has to, you know, he's, he's built up this incredibly lucrative business because of what a big deal it is. Um, it also reminded me of uh, the recent Sessions versus DeMaia case, right? And this uh, is arising under the Fifth Amendment's due process clause. But you have this kind of three-way discussion between the majority, Gorsuch's concurrence, and the dissents about how big a deal deportation is and what level of constitutional protections you are afforded, how strictly we should, you know, um, uh, interpret the Fifth Amendment's due process violations based on, you know, the fact that deportation is a civil uh, is is a civil penalty rather than a criminal penalty, um, and the three kind of paths forward there. You had the 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 majority say, you know, deportation is a really serious thing, right? Um, and therefore, kind of the full measure of due process clause protections ought to apply. Uh, Gorsuch kind of says, well, I agree, but it's not just deportation. There's all sorts of other things, including license denial and that kind of thing. All these other civil penalties can be really life altering, and those ought to receive these significant due process protections as well. And then the dissent saying, well, look, there's a big difference between criminal and civil, right? And because deportation is a, is, uh, is a civil penalty, and is it a penalty at all? Like, well, how do we characterize it? The same questions you're asking in your case. Um, then, then maybe it should receive kind of less due process protection. So it's definitely an issue that kind of cuts across not just you know uh, the Sixth Amendment, but other amendments, yeah. and it's it's a pretty big deal. No, yeah, it is, and you know it also reminds me a little of the the Civil Gideon issue. There's there's been um, um, some advocacy. It hasn't really been very successful yet, but that in certain kinds of civil cases, indigent people also ought to get free lawyers because the the stakes are so high, and and where it's really been pushed most, I think, is in um, uh, removal of custody over children, mm -hmm. where the state's trying to take your children away from you because you're an unfit parent, um, and you can't afford a lawyer, um, and that's you know a, a, a terrible consequence too. And shouldn't you be provided with a a lawyer if you can't afford one? Well, it's it's, it's especially weird in situations like with civil forfeiture, for instance, where the government is essentially accusing you of a crime, but then calls it cr calls it civil rather than criminal, and say, says says. Well, now you don't get a jury right, even or a or right to an any attorney. Kind of due process, hardly. Right, exactly, yeah. because the oh, this is in the civil world, and yet what you're being accused of is violating the criminal law. Right. And not only that, but uh, under civil forfeiture, not only do you not get kind of all the criminal protections, but you don't even get all of the kind of the normal civil protections, right? Where you know uh, you have to prove you're innocent rather than kind of the reverse. It's such a weird yeah. uh, world. Yeah. No, I mean, a tip of the hat to the Institute of Justice, which has done fabulous work on civil forfeiture around the country. And uh, we worked closely with you guys here in the D.C. Council a few years ago to get a uh, 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 a civil forfeiture reform law passed through the council, which hasn't solved all the problems, but made them a lot better. So do you think there's any chance this case would go up to the Supreme Court? No, I don't think so. Um, well, I mean, I, it's a Sixth Amendment constitutional ruling. I suppose it's the government good, has right. the option. Um, and I guess, and it is the U.S. attorney um, that's prosecuting here. It's not being prosecuted by the D.C. attorney general, who I would say would not take it up. But uh, so I suppose there is a, a, a real possibility, and I guess we'll have to check the docket in 90 days and find out, I guess, see if there's anything there. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that just with how important this question is and all these all, all these very important questions about, you know, where where deportation fits is kind of a, you know, uh, on this spectrum of penalties. Um, that it would not be crazy for the government to want to get this decision, even though it only applies to the District of Columbia, to get this decision off the books, right? Um, uh, but they also have to be trying to, you know, you know, figure out if they can count to five and how many votes they would have on on that. Um, and looking at Sessions versus Demaya and other cases like that, and thinking maybe this is not the one we want to bring up. Um, you know, the other thing that this. Uh, 
uh, that, that strikes me about this case is we have an example of an individual who um, actually does want a trial, right? You know, we've, a lot of us are talking these days about kind of the disappearance of jury trials, and we hear about this a lot, but I, I had to go look up some of the numbers um, recently. Uh, and um, in 1997, this is just federal criminal convictions, but uh, 5% of the 63,000 criminal convictions in 1997 um, were the result of a uh, of a jury trial, right? Which five percent does not sound like a ton to me to begin with, right? Um, but by 2015, that had dropped to two percent of 81,000 federal convictions uh, were the product of a jury trial, right? And so there's this there is this disappearance of 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 the jury trial, and you know when we're talking about whether or not he has a right to a jury, I think we can't ask that question without talking about. Um, the reality that even if you have that right, how meaningful is it? Yeah. I mean, the, the reason someone in his circumstance would seek one is because of the deportation. Otherwise, presumably, you'd get a plea bargain for a minor crime like this. The government would agree to seek no more than 10 days in jail or whatever they might decide, and you'd take it. Um, uh and I bet Mr. Badu would be happy if a plea bargain were now offered, which would avoid deportation. Uh, you know, that, that means another piece of the of the silliness here is that even a misdemeanor sexual assault is defined by the federal government as an aggravated felony, and and therefore mandates deportation. So if they can now decide to charge him with jaywalking and he can plead guilty to it, I'm, I'm picking that as a random charge, but something that would not be considered an aggravated felony for immigration purposes, and he could um, um, pay some penalty for what he did but not be deported, I don't represent him, but my guess is he would be fine with that. Well, it is sort of an interesting consequence of these very harsh deportation rules. It, it, yes. you, it almost has to factor into the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. And it sounds like what he did was certainly serious, but at the same time, deportation is an incredibly harsh consequence. Right. That's right. Um, and it allows me to give a, another plug for D.C. home rule. You know, if it was the D.C. attorney general prosecuting here and making these decisions, perhaps something would have been worked out long before now, but it's the U.S. attorney doing it. But they never make bad prosecutorial choices like, you know, prosecuting somebody for uh, throwing three fish overboard or things like that. We should trust U.S. <laughs> attorneys in their, That's their right. prosecutorial decisions. I'm sure everything will work out fine. Okay, well, speaking of the decisions of government employees, that moves us on to the final case for today. Um, Art, you're, Art, you are suing DC's Metro system because of late it has taken to disallowing advertisements on Metro buses and in Metro stations and on, and on the rail cars um, because those advertisements could be considered controversial or political. Um, tell us what posters you, the ACLU, um, have had rejected, and then you have some other plaintiffs who have had. Yeah, so we first filed this case last summer, and, and we had four clients, one of whom was the ACLU, um, the ACLU was running an ad campaign at that point that had the text of the First Amendment in English, Spanish, and Arabic side by side. It's very and controversial. Uh, very controversial. Um, uh, WMATA's policy, which was adopted about uh, two years ago, um, prohibits ads that um, take that that uh, are in our advocacy on um, uh, issues on which members of the public disagree. And um, they wouldn't tell us exactly what it was they thought members of the public disagreed about um, with respect to this ad, but they decided it fell within their prohibition. Um, um, more recently, the ACLU had a, um, a membership conference here in Washington in June and um, decided uh, that we wanted to put up some ads uh, locally about two weeks before the conference because we still had room available at the convention center and hoped that local people would sign up and come. And so we submitted an ad to Metro that said, the headline said, you belong here, meaning you belong at the membership conference, um, ACLU membership conference, June 10 to 12, 2018, and then had a list of some of the, of the speakers and entertainers who would be at the conference. Um, uh, and Metro rejected that too, which which surprised us. We we didn't think this was a. We thought this was an ad to come to a, an event. Um, um, 
when I looked at it, I didn't know about this ad until I learned that it had been rejected. And I looked at it, and the, the background of the ad under this text is a, is a sort of a washed out photo that shows a guy with a megaphone and some people holding signs. It's a demonstration scene. And I thought, well, maybe that's what was bothering them. That you, and you could even read some of the words on the signs in the demonstration, and they said things like, you know, everyone welcome here, no Muslim ban. So I said, let's resubmit this. This came on a Friday afternoon. I said, let's resubmit this first thing Monday morning. Get rid of the background, just the text about the membership conference. Surely they'll take that. And we resubmitted it, and they said no, at which point it seemed to us they were saying you can't advertise because of who you are, because you're the ACLU, not because of anything that's now appearing on this ad. And so we went into court uh, seeking a TRO. We got the same judge who we got in the Doe v. Mattis case. Um, and, um, um, uh, and she had a, a, a hearing in a day or two and um, said she thought it was a very close case, uh, asked Metro's lawyers some tough questions. I left court feeling optimistic about it, but then the next day she um, denied the TRO. Um, And uh, given that at that point the membership conference was about a week away and it takes a week to have the ad printed and distributed and posted, we didn't appeal because there was really no time. Um, Our other clients in the case, which is still pending, include uh, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, They've had a number of ads rejected uh, that um, advocate a a vegan lifestyle. Um, And one example I like to talk about, they have an ad which shows a pig, and the caption is, I'm me, not meat. Go vegan or or eat vegan. Uh, And we contrasted that with an ad that we saw in Metro when we filed the case and and took a picture of it. It's an ad from Chipotle, and it shows this delicious-looking dish of food on a plate, and the headline is Pork a Dice Found. Um, and our, our argument was you let, awesome. <laughs> you, you let Chipotle uh, tout the benefits of eating pork. It's delicious. It's awesome. Um, but you won't let PETA take exactly the opposite view, and this is viewpoint discrimination. Um, we also represent uh, Carafem, which is a, 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 an organization that provides medical abortions, pills that, that terminate a pregnancy if used within 10 weeks. Um, and their ad s- showed a picture of a white pill, and the headline, I'm not sure I remember it exactly, but it said something like, you know, safe, quick, low cost, something like that. And WMATA rejected that on the ground that abortion is a controversial thing. But it it was advertising the availability of a FDA approved medical treatment, and and Metro takes ads for various other you know painless dentistry and back pain clinics and things like that. Um, this wasn't advocating that people get abortions; it was just saying this is available. Um, and our and our fourth client is Milo Yiannopoulos, the the um, uh, the. Um, uh, agitator, if that's the right word, um, who uh, uh, had just published a book last summer uh, called Dangerous, and and his ad was just his picture um, um, and the name of his book, Dangerous, and then next to it it said, Pre-order Now, and at the top of the ad in fairly small print were quotations about him or his book from various media. Um, and uh, Metro rejected that, and ultimately, and we litigated over that in, in a preliminary injunction because he wanted his ad to to go out, you know, to go up when the book was uh, uh, published, so that people would buy it at the at the time when it first was available. And uh, and Metro argued basically that we said this is just an ad for a book. You take ads for other books, and Metro said, well, no, the ad, in our view, incorporates the contents of the book. And and you know and the well-known persona of Milo Yiannopoulos, and therefore it's controversial. And indeed, they had gotten some. The ad actually went up because at first they thought it was just an ad for a book, and they put it up. And then they started getting complaints from writers. You know, how dare you let this right-wing troll advertise on our liberal metro system? And uh, and they took it down. Um, and we lost that too uh, before the same judge. So uh, so it's discouraging so far. But in the meantime, um, the Archdiocese of Washington last November or December filed a very similar case. They had submitted an ad to Metro that showed 
you know, a bright star in the sky and sort of profiles of three shepherds on a hillside. And, um, and I, I don't know if I can quote the legend exactly, but it said something like the, the, the true meaning of Christmas. Maybe one of you remembers the text more exactly than I do, but anyhow, something like that. And then had a website where you could go to the Archdiocese website where it talked about Christmas time services and charitable opportunities and, you know, the, the, the true meaning of Christmas. Um, and, um, and Metro said, no, we have a, another rule. One of our many rules here is no ads about religion, nothing pro-religion or con-religion, and this is a pro-religion ad. And the archdiocese said, but look here, you've got these ads running for the Salvation Army with the red kettle. Um, they are equally a religious organization. And Metro said, no, 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 that ad is only about giving to charity. You know, if you're going to give to charity, give to us. Um, I mean, I I really thought that was, I, I think all of these are good illustrations of how inevitably arbitrary and capricious their decision making has to be under these rules. So Paul Clement came in representing the archdiocese and filed a lawsuit, and Metro hired Don Verilli to defend it, um, a pair that has known each other in court in other circumstances. Um, and, um, and Metro appealed, even though Christmas had now passed, but they want to run this ad again next year, apparently. And so uh, we had uh, Clement against Verilli in the D.C. Circuit in March or April, um, arguing that appeal. Um, so we're waiting for the circuit's decision there, and they have another case involving another organization whose ad was rejected that was argued before a different panel earlier this year. So both of these decisions should be coming out within the next few months. And and both parties, to my case, agreed to stay our litigation until we see what the D.C. Circuit says. Yeah, I mean, these are impossibly hard lines to draw. And, and yet, even if you were trying to draw them, the way that the court here is, in your case, was drawing these lines just seems hard to even believe. I mean, the idea, so for instance, one of the ads that was featured in the um, Milo decision was an ad on behalf of Lockheed, and there was another one on behalf of Boeing. Uh, and they feature a big picture of an airplane, and they say, you know, the F-35 and how great it is. And they say, but that's not a political advertisement. Right, we're just selling airplanes. Right, but of course, like, the whole point of running that ad in the D.C. Metro is to lobby people in Congress, you know, to no, the, appropriate the, money for these staffers, defense programs. Pentagon workers. The, the stations, right. yep. the, those ads run at the Pentagon, Pentagon and station. Pentagon yeah. City Station. Yeah. Right. And so and, like, that's and not it's, political? It's clearly I mean, aimed at the, at the procurement officers and the decision makers there. And right, I mean, of course, it's, uh, it's um, advocacy on an issue on which people disagree. And, and yet, I mean, one of the counterexamples I gave, and I think in, in, the, in the briefing, um, was, you know, if the Quakers submitted an ad to, to uh, Metro that said, war is not the answer, which is the bumper stickers you see on cars around here some, uh, of course they would reject it. There's the, the sort of famous line that, you know, everything is political and it, the personal is, is politics. Right. And, and part of what seems to be going on is this, like, they seem to be sort of seeing the political side of only one side of an issue. That's right. It's, it's really a mainstream versus non-mainstream kind of judgment, I think. You know, who thinks that Chipotle's ad for, for a pork dish is controversial or advocacy? Well, PETA does, uh, and um, um, it may be uh, more subliminal, but, um, but it's certainly taking a side. And um, um, so I, I, you know... Metro doesn't want to have to run ads that will really offend people, um, that may even cause vandalism, that may cause arguments to break out among passengers. I, I understand where they're coming from, but the First Amendment, I think, stands in the way. It's the same fundamental principle that was involved with the Redskins trademark case uh, recently. Some people are very offended by that, and, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be, but um, but um, but uh, giving offense is a viewpoint, as Justice Alito said in his opinion in that case. Yeah, and not only that case, but then you've got, I mean, there are a couple of recent Supreme Court cases with this same theme of what happens when you empower bureaucrats to decide 
just whether something is political or whether something's controversial. There's, of course, you know, the Tam versus Lee case, the Slants case that um, uh, that you, you mentioned that was kind of, you know, tied together with the Redskins case. Yes, right. Sorry, I said it was Redskins. Right, right. It was um, the Redskins slants. was the petition that uh, yeah. I mean, it was denied. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but more recently, this term, the Minnesota Voters Alliance case, right? And there's this... Uh, um, uh, uh, regulation that prohibits the wearing of, I think, well-known uh, political, potentially political apparel to the voting place, right? And there's this great moment in oral argument um, where Justice Alito is trying to suss out how a bureaucrat's supposed to figure out if something's a political message or not, right? But there's this moment when Justice Alito says, okay, I'm trying to figure out what would what you, Minnesota, would consider political. Let's say somebody just wears the text of the Second Amendment on their shirt to the poll. Would that be political? How about a shirt with the text of the Second Amendment? Your Honor, I, I, I think that that could be viewed as political, that that, that would be... How that about be... the First Amendment? <laughs> no, Your Honor, I don't, I don't think the First Amendment. And, Your Honor, I... No, no, the... no what? That it would be covered or wouldn't be allowed? It would be allowed. It would be. It would be. At least you've got the Minnesota lawyer on your side that the text of the First Amendment's okay, right? right. Um, but it really highlights the problem with kind of deputizing these bureaucrats to make these questions of who, what's political, what's controversial, and it's hard to disentangle what's just content-based what versus what's viewpoint-based, right? That's How right. can these not be viewpoint-based? That's right. I mean, it's it's. I don't I don't impugn the good faith of these bureaucrats. I think they're doing what they're. They're trying to do what the regulations say, but inevitably people will not see the controversy in mainstream views and will see the controversy in, in non-mainstream views. And the result is exactly what we're seeing on Metro. Um, you know, they took an ad for Barnum & Bailey Circus when it made its last national tour through here last year, uh, you know, that, and, that showed photos of elephants and lions. And, of course, many people think pizza thinks that's animal abuse, and um, and eventually the public pressure was enough that they went out of business. But Metro didn't think that was controversial. Yeah, I mean, the you know this uh, underscores kind of the whole point of the not just the First Amendment, but the much of the Constitution's restraints, which are counter-majoritarian in nature, right? There's this uh, great moment in history where James Madison is getting ready for the Constitutional Convention, and he's writing down his notes, trying to figure out kind of like what went wrong with the Articles of Confederation. Um, and he says, imagine a world, he creates this hypothetical world, and he writes, suppose there's a world with only three voters in it, right? And two of the voters have interests that are aligned against the third voter. What's going to happen? Um, uh, and he says the prudent man would shun the danger of that scenario, right? You have to build in protections, counter-majoritarian protections for that third individual and that third individual's rights because we all know what's going to happen to the two people who are kind of in the mainstream and the majority are going to adopt a system that's going to run, run roughshod over the rights of that third person, right? And it was that mindset, that concern that a lot of this founding generation took into the Constitutional Convention and then into the debate over the Bill of Rights. Um, how do we make sure that these non-mainstream um, views or perspectives or experiences uh, receive protection from kind of the, the contrary will of the majority? I agree. I'm happy to be on James Madison's side. <laughs> it's always a good side to be on. Yes. Okay, that concludes the show. Thanks for listening, and be sure to tune in next time for more judicial engagement. Until then, this is John Ross from the Institute for Justice, relying on you to get engaged. Mm -hmm.